our next speaker is uh, Dr. Andrea Barry, who is a senior analyst at Joseph Randry Foundation, leading analysis for their work outcome group. She plays a key role in providing and disseminating evidence and analytical work related to the organization's outcomes. Specifically, she's involved in providing analysis and evidence to help more people find a route out of poverty through work. Her research interests include the effects of globalization on work and well-being in the UK, regional imbalances related to productivity and growth in the UK, relieving transport poverty and understanding its effects on types of jobs available to those in poverty. So over to you, Andrea. Looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Let me share my screen. Share. Excellent. Can we all see that? Yep. Yes, we can. Yeah. Right. Let's just wait for it to go. Oh, gosh. Okay. So um, I'd really like to thank Safran for such an interesting discussion. Um, I thought it was a really good way to start out, like how we discuss coronavirus and ethnicity in the UK. Um, and I'd like to start by discussing these pre-existing racial inequalities and um, factors that will mean that certain people will be impacted by this um, storm, I call it, um, over other groups. And um, the Joseph Rountree Foundation is a social change organization, and we focus on poverty and relieving poverty in the UK, as we believe that we can all solve um, poverty in the UK. So I will focus specifically on um, a lot of the evidence around the um, coronavirus storm and also end with what evidence we have found on um, the impact of coronavirus on um, um, black and um, ethnic minorities in the UK. So the approach I will take is just kind of look at a pre-COVID picture around poverty, housing, income, and work um, applied to um, ethnic minorities using the data and evidence we already have. And then I will address the coronavirus storm I think what will be really important to start thinking about now is these two key stats, um, just right here, and this is for all households in the UK, around 19% of them are privately renting compared to 10% 20 years ago, and a third of this group are in poverty. Around 56% of people in poverty are in a working family, and in-work poverty has risen from 10% of workers 20 years ago to 13%. So let's just keep thinking about this, that poverty um, is a problem in the UK for that touches all groups. Um, while certain groups are more likely to be in poverty, um, poverty touches all areas and all groups and it's something we should all solve. And it was something we should solve before coronavirus and it's definitely something we should solve after. So let's just start by going and looking at poverty by ethnicity. And I'm going to, I wouldn't say breeze through some of these stats, but kind of address or um, pay attention to certain statistics that I um, present. Um, just to create this image of a storm and um, this image of people who were not who were not necessarily doing um, so well before coronavirus and coronavirus is only compounded on that. So if we look at the poverty figures by ethnicity, you find certain groups like black households, Bangladeshi and Pakistani have had stubbornly high poverty rates for, uh, for a while is also if you look at the white households, their poverty rates have, have stayed relatively static for, for a while now, whereas the largest decreases have been in Bangladeshi and Pakistani homes. They are still seeing roughly 50% of poverty in Bangladeshi homes and um, close to 45% in Pakistani homes. And that was their picture before coronavirus hit and before there was ec this economic and health shock. If we move on and look by region, not surprisingly, London has one of the highest regions of poverty of about 28 percent compared to the southwest which is 19 percent now why is this why is this important this is important when you think about where most ethnic minorities live so according to the census 2011 census 40 percent of residents in london identified as belonging to either asian mixed or other ethnic group the regions with the highest percentage of black population was london in the West Midlands, and 58% of people who identify as Black live in London. So they'll be living in London with the highest poverty rates um, by region. There are multiple factors um, that influence this, just so there are multiple factors that contribute to inward poverty. But 
being in low paid works makes, makes it very difficult to escape poverty. Um, in work poverty rates in London are amongst the highest, but rates of low pay are comparatively low. With only 20% of employees in London earning less than a real living wage in 2017-18, in the second lowest of all areas behind the Southeast, which was 19%. So like I said, this is a really important um, aspect of you know, ethnicity and poverty is um, place. Um, and another point to make is that um, over, there's been a, a significant change to the contribution of people's income. This is for everyone, not just um, people um, from a um, BAME background. And the largest change is to their in income has been housing costs and um, their net income before housing costs and after housing costs. If you also look at the change to their benefits income, it's dropped significantly while um, net earnings have stayed relatively um, static over time. Um, if we go to next and address housing, which was kind of that big bar on the last slide. Um, there's been an increase in private renting, um, not just um, for the entire population, but specifically for black households. And there's a severe lack of home ownership. Um, when we talk about overcrowding, I'm really happy to mention overcrowding um, because when we talk about it, you know, black and ethnic minority households are more likely to live in overcrowded households than housing than white households. And like she said, it's not necessarily a cultural choice. Poverty makes that choice for you. So if you are in poverty, it, it just means you do not have access to affordable housing that would allow you as a multi-generational home to live comfortably, which is what everyone wants to live um, in a non-overcrowded housing um, happily and be able to afford the housing they're in and not um, be in poverty because of their housing. Um, again, this is just kind of showing that um, um, if you're a Black, Indian, Pakistani, or Bangladeshi household, you are disproportionately more likely to be private renting, but also you're more likely to be living in housing association and local and social renting um, homes. But your owner occupied households for black households is especially quite low. It's 1.8% compared to 91% um, of all owner occupied homes are white. Um, now, we can start thinking about why that might be really important during um, coronavirus and also a, an upcoming economic shock and recession. Why is um, the security of owning your own home or living in a home you can afford really important during a time like this? But we will address this in a minute. And so we can start talking about the rising tide of in-work poverty. And if I can draw your attention to the um, ethnicity stat for Black, African, Caribbean, and Black British households um, for 2016-17 to 2017-18, um, their in-work poverty figure is over 25%. It's close to 27.5%. But I'd also like to draw your attention to single parents. Their in-work poverty figure is 30%. So if you think about intersection, intersection, intersectional work, if you're a Black African Caribbean household who's also a single parent, your poverty rates will be quite in-work poverty rates will be quite high. Um, this, I think, just kind of reiterates the point that the um, pre-coronavirus picture for um, Black and um, other ethnic minorities in poverty looks very different, and it's, it is also to do their to their work um, and where they work and um, their work status. So are they more likely to be work full-time, part-time, self-employed, or unemployed? And these variations in work status will be really important when we talk about the um, lockdown effect of coronavirus. So if, if we look at the self-employed figure for, um, where is it? Bangladeshi, Pakistani, and also um, Chinese households, that's quite high compared to other figures like white Irish or white British. Um, and that might matter, I think, especially in a uh, coronavirus picture when these, where they work as self-employed really counts. So not only the fact that they're self-employed, but the sectors they're working in self-employed as well. So even before the crisis, um, JRF found that workers in the food, accommodation, and retail sectors were at greatest risk, risk of inward poverty. And this was amplified further for disabled workers, workers from a BAME background, single parents, and it suggests that these families are even more at risk of being pulled into deepening poverty 
um, by actions or um, waves out, outside of their control. And again, talking about these sector inequalities pre-COVID-19, um, according to the Running Meat Trust, one third of Bangladeshi men work in catering, restaurants, and related businesses compared to about one in a hundred white British men. One in 1,000 white British men work in taxi, chauffeuring, and related businesses compared to one in seven Pakistani men. And black and um, ethnic minority workers are more likely to participate in the gig economy, up 25% compared to 14% of the general population. Sorry about that. Um, while employment rates have been increasing before COVID-19, the employment rate for black, African, Caribbean, Asian, Pakistani, and Indian um, populations are still lower, and in many cases, much lower than white British um, population. Now, we'll, kind, we'll discuss, once we look at the effects of coronavirus, we will discuss why this matters. Why would it, why would it matter um, that your, as a population, your employment levels are lower than other populations? Why, does this, why do we care, essentially, in this discussion? Um, but to start discussing that, I think we will look at pay inequities and the subsequent wealth gap from that. So the Runnymede Trust um, in their um, um, Color of Money report discussed pay inequities over time. And to support this work, the Resolution Foundation conducted some regression analysis to understand the differences in pay. So you have your raw pay gap and then your adjusted pay gap. And this is comparing black men, Indian men, Pakistani, Bangladeshi men, and white women to white men aged between 22 and 64 in the UK. When they conducted the adjusted pay gap for graduates and non-graduates, they adjusted it for any differences between groups that may explain the pay gap other than, for example, the unknown. So they, they took into account you know, what they call compositional factors. So for example, some ethnic groups are more likely to be younger and work part-time, but they also took into effect age, qualification, region, whether the person is UK born, the length of time since they left education, do they work part-time, full-time, occupation, industry, etc. They took into account um, also length of time they've worked for their employer and whether in a permanent contract. And even taking into account all of these outside factors, they found that the pay inequity for black men compared to white men, graduate men is 17%. So think about what 17% could mean. Um, as we discussed previously, black men um, and you know, the whole black population is more likely to live in London with perhaps higher housing costs and higher um, cost of living, for example. 17% difference in income um, in pay between those groups would be quite significant and that's thousands of pounds lost a year in their pay. Um, I also believe the Runnymede Trust did some work and um, in, again in, in conjunction with Resolution Foundation and they, they took the same person, same gender and age, doing the same job in the same region, black man versus a white man and found that the pay gap was still relatively close to 17%. So that suggests serious gaps between um, income and um, and I would almost say possibilities because as we as we we um, say you know when you're in poverty it does remove that choice so if, if from the offset after you if you after you graduate if you're going to start on a pay packet 17 percent less than your peer who is the exact same as you other than the fact that they might be a different ethnicity that's a significant disadvantage that you are already going into pay, into work with and also it does affect your family it affects generations and that generational um, um, aggregation of this pay penalty can impact as i said in a recent blog it can impact your ability to buy a home your ability to save for the future you'll you'll have a lower pension for example um, and etc. So let's start thinking about the storm. So we, we've set the stage, the pre-COVID stage. Um, we have um, people who are locked in poverty with low paid and insecure work, higher housing costs, um, rising cost of living. And then the storm hits and it's, it's the same storm, but we're in all different boats. So we have someone at the top here who, who is struggling but um, um, head above water. But then unfortunately the person at the bottom has a hole in their boat and they're trying to get rid of it by dumping the water on the outside. They're, they're, they're in a boat without a paddle and they're, they're sinking, they're suffering. 
you know, what, what, what is the storm in this context? Now, the storm for coronavirus was um, the loss of earnings, hours, and then also an additional cost from being at home. Um, the furlough scheme was a good scheme for keeping people in work, but the problem when it came to the furlough scheme is that it cut people's incomes, um, possibly um, they had a loss of income about 20%. Now for some people that really won't matter, you know, they'll cut costs in different ways, but it won't bring them into poverty or it won't um, exacerbate their, their pre-existing poverty status. But as we'll see in a minute from some polling work that was done and also some survey work from Understanding Society, that, that could um, really become detr detrimental to their ability to um, run their household and essentially live. Now let's go into the effects of this coronavirus storm. Um, we look at um, this work was um, from the Understanding Society Working Paper Series from May 2020. It uses new data from the Understanding Society COVID-19 survey that they started, which was collected in April 2020, and it shows how the economic shock caused um, by the pandemic can affect individuals, different, indi individuals differently. And if we look at um, this first um, chart, and I've, I've helped y'all out with an arrow to exactly what I want to talk about, um, this looks at people who have lost hours. So for these people who have lost hours um, and decides where they lost their hours. So did they lose it because their employer cut them? Were they furloughed? Did, was there a loss of self-employment business? Were they made un unemployed? Or was it because of health reasons? And as you see, if you compare BAME versus non-BAME, there was a distinct difference. So they were more likely to have lost self-employment business. They're more likely to become unemployed and they're more likely to be, have their hours cut because of health reasons. And if we go next to, um, now, what happens when your hours are cut? You have a reduction of income. Um, do you fall behind in your bills? Do you fall in behind with your housing? Are you now, is there a difference now in hunger? Or do you reduce your spending? And as we see with, um, we compare BAME and not BAME, even before coronavirus, they were more likely to be in behind in their bills. As you can see from um, that first um, column in 2017-18, they were more likely to be behind in their bills. And it's even worse now after. So they're more likely behind in their bills. They're um, also gonna be behind with housing costs. They're more likely to say that they've experienced hunger and they're reducing their spending. They're trying to min mitigate their losses. And finally, how do they um, do even more mitigation of their losses? They They use savings, they borrow, they're more likely to take a mortgage holiday, um, and therefore fall into debt, and they are going to apply for universal credit um, at a higher rate than other people. Now, this does, um, I'll briefly mention this, this does pair with our own polling that we did for a recent briefing, where we found that 86% of BAME respondents have had to cut back on at least one essential, compared with 69% of white respondents, and that 65% of BAME respondents were behind with at least one out of council tax, rent, or mortgage, or other bills compared to 48% of white respondents. And debt is a more common experience for BAME respondents during the coronavirus storm, with 74% of them reporting that they resort to borrowing compared to 57% of white respondents. So what can we do? That's what we always say at JRF. What? How can we solve this? What? How can we as a society solve this? Um, we have a few um, policy recommendations that um, if you would like more information on they are available on our website and various briefings and blogs um, but I think the three of the more important ones that would you know, specifically apply to black and ethnic minorities is an increase to the local housing allowance to cover median rents in all areas and access to more affordable housing uh, also relaxing labor market constraints and removing barriers and equities to alleviate more poverty, and then finally to strengthen the support for self-employed people and universal credit by removing the minimum income floor rule. And that is me done. Great, thank you very much, Andrea. That was really, really interesting and eye-opening and uh, worrying, but good. <laughs> um, so we've um, gone over time uh, a little bit, but we do have some time for questions. So if anyone's got any questions for Andrea, then please do send them in through the Q&A function and we'll, we'll try and get through as many as we can.
Um, so I'll just give people a couple of minutes to, or a couple of seconds to start typing, um, and then we'll see see what comes through. I'm not sure if it's my internet connection being a bit slow, but I don't have any um, any questions coming through at the moment. So what we can do is we can save your um, kind of Q and A time um, and come back to it at the end. And then if anything comes through um, in the meantime, I can make a note of it. And when we get to the end of the presentations, um, if anyone's got any any further questions um, to come back to you on, we can we can do that if that if that's all right with you. Yeah, I th yeah, I do think it might might be something. To do internet on a bit of a time delay oh no we've got one one through here um so uh, i'm afraid i can't say who it's from because their username is a combination of letters um which i don't think it is apology I, I don't know how to pronounce it if it is a name but i don't think it is um so I, the question is i think you said that 19 percent of households are in private rented accommodation a third of those in poverty do you put housing costs down to the poverty a really really important question thank you because it gets into how we describe poverty so poverty is also is described two or even three different ways and one of them is before housing costs and after housing costs and the poverty figures i gave are all after housing costs um, we acknowledge that there are people even before housing costs who do not have enough money they simply do not have enough money to meet their basic goals or their basic um, um, bills and then there's people who after housing costs um, so before housing costs, they could, but after they cannot. So whether or not all of those people after housing costs cannot meet their um, are in poverty because of housing, I cannot um, statistically say with certainty, but we can say that um, access to affordable housing is essential for ensuring that that after housing cost figure drops and declines. Um, there are other so many factors around um, after housing cost poverty that enters this discussion, like the social security system being an anchor to help people and keep people out of poverty and also work being a root out of poverty, that it would be so difficult to say it's just housing, but we can see a correlation. That's not necessarily a causation when it comes to poverty and housing. Don't know if that answered it. Yeah, well, yeah, I think it probably did. Um, yes, oh, it's Bridget, um, who is the person who asked the question and she says many thanks. So I I think that means yes it did thank you very much um so i haven't got any more um questions at the moment but i will um make a note to allocate you a bit of extra time in the open section later um if, if we do have anything i suspect your presentation was just so comprehensive that um that people know kind of know what you were you were saying and uh just sitting pondering the implications for for where we go from here at the moment um but that was really really great thank you very much andrea i really really enjoyed your presentation